So welcome to the final segment of History Swiftly. This is our seventh virtual field trip this year and the final one for the 2020-2021 school year. And you guys voted, and I had to listen to your vote, you sent me to Miami for this field trip. So while here we are going to be focusing on some of the history in Miami, some art in Miami, and some architecture. So join me for the ride. So I'm at Wynwood Walls in Wynwood in Miami, which was an old warehouse district that um, a guy named Tony Goldman in 2009, trying to revitalize this area, which was not the, the best area of Miami, started to encourage world-renowned graffiti artists to come in and paint graffiti throughout uh, this, this area here. Now it's a, it's a tourist attraction and the area has sort of embraced that whole graffiti style of art. All of the buildings are incredibly vibrantly painted with graffiti art. And I gotta say, I'm not usually a fan of graffiti. Usually when I see graffiti, uh, automatically my blood pressure starts to rise because I just, I, I don't like it on buildings. But this sort of celebrates it. And some cities have done this. You know, I, re I remember students, taking students years and years ago uh, up to Montreal and Quebec over spring break on a French field trip. And uh, the tour guide that was with us who was, uh, uh, Quebecois himself, somebody that was from the area, said that in, it was Quebec City, in Quebec City, that on some of the underpasses, um, under the, the, like the, the major highways there, they would actually encourage artists to go in and paint graffiti as, as art. And that way they could sort of, uh, I guess, limit where the graffiti would be in historic Quebec City um and prevent it from being in places that they didn't want it by encouraging it in other areas so we're going to do a little walk around here and you guys get to see some of the incredible i mean it really is incredible graffiti art some of the artwork done by uh world-renowned artists uh people from uh the united states obviously brazil belgium mexico portugal ukraine uh let's see greece spain germany france england japan singapore and uh, that's it so there are about 50 artists representing 16 countries it's over 80 thousand square feet of painted walls here so it's a commitment to graffiti and street art and uh, that's sort of the theme of this trip since it's not really early american history we're talking about sort of art and architecture uh, and the vibrancy of america today so the work in front of us is done by a chilean artist and then off to the right here as i pan and scan uh, this is done by a brazilian artist here at winwood walls this one is done by a Canadian artist. I don't really quite understand it. It looks like there are crocodile or alligator jaws there and uh, a woman on her side and uh, and back out of the water over there. So, and then some vibrant geometric shapes. The place is really quite huge. This one's done by a Norwegian artist, Martin Watson. And obviously I'm not familiar with that name. To me, it looks a little bit like the, uh, the, the British artist, Banksy, but uh, again, I'm sure an art critic would say that I'm completely wrong on that, but uh, it looks a little Banksy-like to me. This one is done by a British artist from the uh, UK, and it sort of depicts a scene from China. I'm thinking that is Japanese, although I'm sure somebody's gonna correct me, probably my wife who speaks fluent Mandarin. Uh, or my stepdaughter who's taking Japanese in college, but it uh, looks like a, a city scene from somewhere in Asia. Uh, some, some are just strange. I don't quite get a sense of this one, but again, I'm no art critic. Again, maybe this means something to someone out there that can explain it to me. Um, if you can, please do so, but another sort of, I'll say, strange uh, graffiti art from a Spanish artist and uh, an American artist straight ahead at uh, Wynwood Wall. So we're going to move on now. I uh, hope you like some of the graffiti art here in Miami. Just to give you an idea how this uh, Wynwood Wall has sort of revitalized the area and certainly embraced art and uh, graffiti art. Here is even a new condo units that have uh, a huge mural on the side of them there. So pretty cool. So continuing my theme of art and architecture and a little bit of history here in Miami, uh, this is kind of cool. This is a 900-year-old monastery 
here in Miami, Florida. I'm in North Miami, and this is a Spanish monastery that was actually deconstructed in Spain and was brought here in the early 20th century and reconstructed stone by stone. And I'll give that story as we walk around. So this is an ancient Spanish monastery uh, that was built in Spain. It was named uh, Saint Bernard de Clairvoix. It was uh, begun in the province of Segovia in 1133. And it took 11 years to build. It was occupied by monks for the next 700 years. But then there was some political and social upheaval in the 1830s in Spain and uh, the cloisters of the church um, were sold and were converted into a stable. And then in the early 20th century, a uh, newspaper uh, publisher, a um, very wealthy and influential person of the early 20th century, uh, William Randolph Hearst, visited the Spanish monastery and uh, he fell in love with the ornate cloisters and he purchased them. And the 800 year old structure was then dismantled stone by stone, numbered, packed in hay and shipped to the United States in 11,000 boxes. 11,000 boxes. Um, but there was a problem. There was serious hoof and mouth disease that uh, there was an outbreak in Spain. Uh, so they had to break open the boxes and burn the hay upon the shipment of it uh, arriving in New York. And as a result of that, it took 23 men three months to open the boxes, which contained seven tons of nails and to remove all of the stones. After the hay was burned, they put the stones back into the boxes, but they did not put them into the matching boxes. So after the Great Depression hit and Hearst fell, on, uh, fell into some financial trouble, he was forced to sell his collection here. The stone sat in Brooklyn warehouse for the next 26 years until 1952, when um, a Miami businessman, or actually a couple of them, decided to buy them and turn them into a tourist attraction here in North Miami. So it was brought here to Miami and it took 19 months to ship and reassemble uh, these cloisters here, the ancient Spanish monastery. It cost $1.5 million, but the investors who thought that this was gonna be a tourist attraction uh, sort of failed. Uh, when they built US-1, they actually circumvented the area where these monasteries were. So it was a tourist attraction with no tourists as tourists were sort of detoured around this area. So eventually they had to sell their, uh, their cloisters here to the Episcopal Church and it's the Episcopal Church who now owns it today and it's a it's a active church and it's uh, free to get into which is kind of cool. So so the architectural style is Romanesque. However, uh, during the construction of the original cloisters uh, several centuries ago, the monks that were, that were uh, sort of the architects in building and designing it traveled to France and fell in love with Gothic architecture. And as a result of that, it is sort of a blend between Romanesque and Gothic architecture here. And it really is absolutely spectacular. Now, as my field trips always include, obviously, a cemetery and ice cream, I was hoping to be able to tell you that William Randolph Hearst was buried here. But alas, he is not. He's buried actually out in California, which is where he died. Oh, there's some pretty bells. So I'm still looking for a graveyard, but maybe just the mere mention of where he's buried is going to have to be close enough here in Miami. But I'll continue to work on that. I can't say that I know any of the people behind me, but this is obviously where um, the dead are buried, cremations, no doubt. So, a cemetery, sort of. Okay, so I'm gonna be signing off here from the ancient Spanish monastery. Behind me is a statue from the year 1141. It's Alfonso VII, who was the uh, king of Leon and Castile of Spain, and it looks like he's had better days there. So, Key Biscayne was originally settled by Native Americans. Uh, in 1513, Ponce de Leon, who found fresh water here, claimed it for the King of Spain. Now, obviously, the United States gained possession of Florida in 1821. And through what treaty? That would be the Adams Onus Treaty. And this lighthouse was first lit on December uh, 17, 1825. But 
1836, Native Americans who were forced south, uh, into South Florida by the Seminole Wars uh, attacked and burned the lighthouse and the caretaker's house. Um, but the lighthouse was rebuilt to its current height of 95 feet and was relit on April 30th, 1847. So here is a view of the caretaker's house for the lighthouse and a view of the lighthouse and a uh, view of the, of the bay and I'll walk out there. So off the coast of Key Biscayne here is an area called Stiltsville and I'm gonna to try to zoom in on it here. You're gonna see some houses that were actually constructed in the 1920s and 1930s. I know it's kind of, sort of hard to see here. I'm not sure I can zoom in on them. So they are built on stilts. They're about 10 feet above water. The water is not deep actually where that is. It's only one to three feet deep. And in the 1920s and 30s, there were over 20 houses that were built uh, about a mile or so off the coast of Key Biscayne, which put them in sort of uh, outside of the jurisdiction of prohibition. So a lot of vice activities went on out there. Uh, today, there's only about seven houses that remain. But in the 1940s and 1950s, it became a very popular place. Um, lawyers, bankers, politicians, other moneyed elite here in Miami would go to drink, to relax, to kick back, uh, and sometimes get raided by the police for those vice activities. So I'm now at the home of James Deering, uh, who in the early 20th century retired as the um, uh, president of uh, Harvester International, and he built this home that's behind me called Vizcaya. It's on the uh, Biscayne Bay, and uh, it's sort of a, a blend between Italian and Caribbean architecture. Well over 100 acres of expansive house and unbelievable gardens. So we're going to walk around here, uh, early 20th century home, and I'll give you a little history as we go. So when James Deering retired in 1908, he bought this property over 100 acres and uh, wanted a, a retirement home here in South Florida in Miami. Well, over 100, 100 acres of land, uh, the house is both Italian and Caribbean in style, and we're gonna head inside, and even when you're inside, you're gonna feel like you're outside on the bay. Here are his Italian gardens straight ahead through this leaded stained glass window here. We'll walk outside in a few minutes. I think they must be doing some work upstairs so you can hear the power tools going. But here is the main atrium area. And as I said, uh, even though we're sort of inside, you can certainly feel the outside in. So an incredibly spacious atrium here. And usually the second floor is open, but you can see that they have uh, some clear tarp up as they're doing some work upstairs. Check this out. An old telephone booth with a prototype of the new iPhone 13. Not yet to be released. They're going old school. We're going to go over to the gardens in just a minute here, but here's the back of the house, which opens up to Biscayne Bay. And uh, what would have been in the early 20th century, an old party barge. It's made out of cement, so obviously it would never go anywhere. And it is some, some disrepair now, but you can see that they're working on it. So maybe again, it'll be open to visitors, at least being able to walk out there. And uh, some outbuildings as well that are still being worked on now and uh, I read on the inside that the reason the upstairs is closed is because they're doing some roofing work up top so let's head over to the gardens so the house was finished in the in the late 19 teens and the gardens were finished in 1923 uh, James Deering died in 1925 and the house passed through a number of members of his family uh, and it was hit hard by hurricanes in both 1926 and 1935 and had to be reconstructed now if you fast forward about 20 years or so into the 1950s uh, there was a question as to what to do with this magnificent estate and eventually the uh, County of Miami, Miami-Dade County purchased it and has now made it into this uh, tourist site and art museum. And we're going to walk down into the gardens in just a second.
And if you remember the sunroom with the leaded glass windows there, the stained windows there, that room is. And here are the gardens. So the gardens are sort of framed by a bunch of live oak trees here, which might look as if they are centuries old. They were actually brought here in 1917 when the gardens started to be constructed. Now, they were mature specimens when they were brought in. They were brought in from some places uh, in and around Miami and actually Cuba. Now, here's a trivia question for you. What is the oldest naval warship not only still afloat but actively commissioned in the United States Navy that was made out of live oak when Joshua Humphreys designed it and is uh, known as Old Iron Size because the size of it were so strong from this live oak that cannonballs bounced off the side of it. I'll give you a hint, it's up outside of Boston. We're now gonna head from Biscaya on the Biscayne Bay, but we're not done with architecture as we still have uh, South Beach and the Art Deco District of Miami. So I'm a Mariners fan, not a Marlins fan. The Marlins have a couple things on the Mariners though, and that would be two World Series, as the Mariners have won zero. They won 116 game ones, more than any other team in Major League Baseball. But then the darn Yankees beat us in the playoffs in 2001, and I don't think they've been back to the playoffs since 2003, which is the longest drought of any Major League team in sports. Not good. Anyway, I am sitting in the dugout of the Marlins in Marlins Stadium here. And uh, for a dome, it's pretty awesome. We are now on Miami Beach and we're looking at Art Deco architecture, which had its heyday in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, it was first introduced in Paris in 1925. It sort of blends historic retro bright colors uh, all into one here. Um, characteristically, the, the, the colors are pastel blues, pinks, bright oranges, yellows, greens. Um, some of the buildings will have uh, exotic flora and fauna motifs inside, geometric fountains or statues, whimsical uh, pastel painting colors, porthole windows, shiny curves, glass blocks, chrome accents and uh, interesting tiled floors. So we'll try to get a few examples, but uh, Miami Beach is famous for its Art Deco. So standing here on Ocean Drive here, you can see one of the motifs on this building is Art Deco building from the 1930s, the sort of porthole windows, but we're gonna try to find some better examples of that. And then looking down Ocean Drive, you see all other colorful buildings, and I don't wanna get hit by a bike rider here. Um, that are from the 1920s and 30s. There are actually 800 buildings here in, uh, in Miami, on Miami Beach, that are National uh, Historic Register uh, buildings because of their importance in the Art Deco movement of the early 20th century. Here's a pretty perfect example of Art Deco architecture with the columns and the uh, windows and uh, next to it some of the uh, floral motifs. Um, this hotel from the 1930s would have uh, been a popular hangout for some of the elite here in Miami, including Clark Gable and Dorita Hayworth. Okay, we obviously have to make a little stop at uh, world famous Miami Beach and the sort of white sands here really is beautiful. And even the lifeguard stations are brightly colored. Oh yeah. So you have to guess the flavor. Ocean Drive here in South Beach, Miami also includes the house of Gianni Versace who lived and died here in Miami, and that's his house. Today it is a very high-end restaurant, very, very high-end restaurant. Um, 
Some of the entrees go for $120. Caviar was $250. I'm, I'm not going there for lunch or dinner. I don't know. Look who I found here. This is, uh, <laughs> this is Tom. What do they call you at school? Uh, Mr. Swift. Mr. Swifty. Swifty. Look at Mr. Swifty here. <laughs> Mr. Swifty came down to visit, and uh, he, was, he came to give me a history lesson, right? I did. Who, what did Benjamin Franklin do at the... I don't know. What do you got? Is this a history class? It is a history class. Is he a good teacher? Uh, he seems like a good teacher. Uh, I just want to say, kids, that uh, you got... <laughs> Was Mr. there a question there? Or... No, no yeah, okay. they don't care about that. All right, all right. I got Mr. Swifty here. He came to visit us in uh, Florida, right? That, that's where we are. He, uh, his brother works for the Beach Boys. He's over there. Not quite as handsome as Mr. Swifty, no, but, you know... He's got the look. He's got, he's got the hair. He got the right. Yeah, he got the hair. Well, uh, I wish you all the best out there. How old are the eighth grade you said, Eighth right? grade. Fourteen. Fourteen, very good. And what do you teach them? History, but specific? U.S. history. U.S. history. And if, and they're going to be writing about this time in history a lot, aren't they? They will be. Yeah, yeah we, we've talked a lot about it. Yeah. Well, I hope maybe I'll come visit someday. That'd be great. I'm not good at history, but um, I'd like to meet you all someday. All right, well, good luck. Be good kids. Study hard. Don't get, get rid of the social media. Put that out of your mind, right? It's noise. Absolutely. Don't believe it. Don't get in the middle <laughs> of it. Don't let it affect you. Don't let it hurt your feelings. Don't let it come into your soul. It's terrible, that social media. I got to tweet this right now. Yeah, remember to give me your Instagram address. <laughs> no, but the truth is, you know. Follow me on. Follow me. Yeah, right. The truth is, don't let it get you, man. Don't, don't get caught up in it because it's only going to, it's all bullshit. And I'm lucky I didn't have it when I was your age, you know. Because, but if I could go back to my eighth grade self, I'd say, it's gonna be okay. You're gonna you're gonna do fine in, in the world. Just be good. Be a kind, nice person. Treat the teacher with respect, and you're gonna be okay. All right. God bless you all. Bye bye. Oh yeah, watch Big Shot, my new show. So I'm signing off my final segment of history swiftly for the 2020-2021 school year. Uh, we did seven of them. We traveled uh, all up and down the East Coast, mostly in Pennsylvania, but Miami Beach. So thank you for traveling with me, and I will. See you in class.